Good evening, everyone. Welcome. I first like to begin to uh, thank you all for being here tonight. I'd like to uh, thank our uh, co-presenter for uh, this evening tonight. As you know, this uh, evening is presented by several local Jewish organizations. First, I'd like to uh, thank the Jewish Federation of Greater Vancouver and acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, Shelley Rifkin, Executive Director. I thank her personally for her uh, friendship and uh, for her partnership in uh, uh, making this possible, as well as the Jewish Family Services Agency, which I see uh, uh, some uh, staff uh, here in the room. I also want to thank uh, Congregation Charit Sedek and uh, Program Coordinator Shelly Carroll uh, as well for her uh, partnership and uh, for her friendship uh, in making this evening possible for the Vancouver community as well as uh, the JCC, the Jewish Community Center of Vancouver. I think that um, this says something about this program and hopefully many more, uh, this community partnership coming together uh, with the Jewish Academy to uh, provide uh, for you top quality uh, adult education. The Jewish Academy is the newly launched and recent initiative of Chabad of Downtown. In the words of our Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, uh, sent greetings to the opening of the Academy. This new institution will offer your membership strong educational programs and enrich enriching opportunities that will inspire lifelong learning and an enduring appreciation for Jewish values. I think that if I was to sum up the, um, the academy and the reasons, the goal, the purpose, I think the best way would be to read you a, a portion of a letter we received from Chief Rabbi Lord Sachs in honor of the opening of the academy. There is no more important task than that of Jewish education. That is why the opening and official launch of the Jewish Academy is such a vital initiative. For Jews, education is not just what we know, it's who we are. No people ever cared for education more. Our ancestors were the first to make education a religious command and the first to create a compulsory universal system of schooling. The Egyptians built pyramids, the Greeks built temples, the Romans built theaters, Jews built schools. They knew that to defend, to defend a country you need an army, but to defend a civilization you need education. So Jews became the people whose heroes were teachers, whose citadels were schools, and whose passion was study and the life of the mind. Jewish education and Jewish learning is not only our heritage and history, it is also the single most important factor that will determine and define the Jewish future. Education counts for more in the long run than wealth or power or privilege. Put simply, those who know, grow. We are proud to uh, offer for the Vancouver community ongoing courses and lectures that have attracted on a monthly, on a monthly basis um, 
just over 180 people with all the programs combined. And tonight, we're happy to invite and we have the privilege to host um, a speaker as Rabbi Shea Staub. Rabbi Taub is scholar of historic and mystical text. He is renowned in the world at large as a man whose message of spiritual healing has brought hope to tens of thousands of people all over the globe. In 2010, Abbe Taub's groundbreaking book on addiction recovery entitled God of Our Understanding rocketed to number one Jewish bestseller on Amazon. His message also became a sudden favorite, favorite among non-Jews in recovery. The New York Times reported on Abbe Taub's reputation outside of the Jewish world. They followed him to a professional training seminar that he led at the Boys Town Orphanage in Omaha, Nebraska. The New York Times declared Rabbi Tab has become a phenomenon. He has been interviewed as an addiction expert by NPR as well as, as, well as CBC Radio. His work was praised as a singular resource for those in need by Publishers Weekly. A regular Huffington Post contributor, Rabbi Tab also edits JewishRecovery.org, a site on addiction recovery powered by Chabad.org, a Jewish Judaism online mega site. Rabbi Tab's schedule today in Vancouver also included earlier this afternoon a uh, two hours workshop for professionals and community leaders in the field of mental health. I have to say I was at the workshop moved and inspired um, for the second time by Rabbi Taub and by the presence of um, so many dedicated people who truly care. Dozens of audiences on three continents have made Rabbi Taub one of the most in demand speaker on human spirituality today. Topic for tonight is emotional sobriety. Can you become addicted to bad feelings and toxic relationships? Using spiritual tools of recovery to improve our lives. On a personal note, I first want to say thank you to Rabbi Taub for being so accommodating um, in flexible in, in allowing um, his schedule to work around the hurricane and to make sure that uh, he will be here for the Vancouver community this week. Turns out we have the privilege to also offer uh, and invite you for two more programs, actually three more programs with Rabbi Taub to take place in Vancouver. Without further ado, call Rabbi Taub uh, to please uh, share with us emotional sobriety. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you, Rabbi Beton, for such a um, warm introduction. Um, let me reciprocate by saying it is an immense honor to be here at the launch of the Jewish Academy, and I want to join with everyone here in wishing you absolute success beyond whatever you even dream, and I know that you dream big, but it should be even more than what you're imagining, and the influence of the Jewish Academy on Jewish education and Jewish life here in this city should uh, flourish and should reach many, many people, many families for generations to come. Uh, it's true that we were originally scheduled for Tuesday night, and then God had other plans in the form of Hurricane Sandy. So, um, yeah, I've been traveling since 4.30 in the morning Eastern Time. It's like 1.30 a.m. 
Vancouver time, and I was um, <laughs> I was uh, thinking of a, a story having to do with travel. That there was once a guy. He had this thing. Whenever he flew, he had to have the aisle seat. That was his thing. And he was so into it, he would call like three months before, and he would book the ticket, and he, would, he wouldn't do it online, because he, he has to speak to a person. And he would confirm with the person, is this, you know, 32F, is that the ILC? Yeah, it is the ILC. Okay. Then a month before, he would call again, he would confirm it again. Two weeks before, he would call again. The week of, he'd call every day. The day before, he'd drive down to the airport. He'd speak to the ticketing agent. And then the day of, obviously, he'd get there a few hours early, and he would not let them print his boarding pass so they would look him in the eye and tell him, yes, 32F is an ILC. That was his thing. So he flew to his uh, point of destination, and he gets there, and his friend comes to pick him up. And he looks agitated. His friend says, what's wrong? You look upset. Is anything, uh, anything troubling you? He says, yeah, there's something troubling me. Three months ago, I booked this ticket. I made them tell me that it's an aisle seat. A month ago, I called. I confirmed again that it's an aisle seat. Two weeks ago, they confirmed it's an aisle seat. This week, I went, I called every single day. Yesterday, I went down to the airport. This morning, I wouldn't let them print out my boarding pass till they looked me in the eye. They tell me 32F, it's an aisle seat. I got on my plane. I want you to know what happened. What do you think? It wasn't an aisle seat. So, yeah, I'm a little bit upset. So his friend says to him, if it was so important to you, why didn't you ask the person in the aisle seat to, to switch? He says, don't you think I thought of that? There was nobody sitting in the aisle seat. <laughs> There's an old story, Chelm story. You guys know Chelm? The wise people of Chelm? There's a story from Chelm about this guy. He went to the bathhouse to go clean up. You know, before they have uh, indoor plumbing, so everybody goes to the bathhouse. And uh, he gets undressed, and he's about to head for the baths, and he, he realizes that uh, without any clothes on, uh, he looks pretty similar to everybody else there. And he says, you know, it's a possibility that I'll get mixed in with the crowd, and by the time I'm done, I'll come back to get my clothes, and I won't know which clothes are mine, because I'll get mixed in with everyone else. I won't remember, I won't know who I am. So he's thinking, what should I do? You know, how can I dis uh, distinguish myself here? And uh, he gets an idea, because he was a smart guy, right? So he, he had a smart idea. He says, you know, my pocket in, uh, in my coat has a thread stitched in the lining. It's a red thread, I'll pull it out, and I'll take the red thread, I'll tie it on my big toe, and then that's how I'll know who I am. I'll come out of the bath, I'll look around, I'll see who's got a red string on their toe, and the one who does, that'll be me. So, pulls the string out of the pocket, ties it on his toe, and now he's secure enough to go uh, wash up. Of course, wouldn't you know it, one thing leads to another, and when he's covered with the warm water and the suds and whatnot, the red string slides right off of his toe. And unbeknownst to him, he just walks off, he leaves it behind. <coughs> Meanwhile, some other Chelmite walks by with his wet foot, and he steps on the wet string, and of course it clings to his toe. So our original guy gets out of the bath, and according to a plan, he starts uh, scanning around. He sees, no, not, not, not here. No, where is it? And he doesn't see the red string. He thought he would see it more quickly. And he starts to panic. He's feeling actually quite a bit of anxiety about this because he's got to get home. He's got to make sure he goes to the right house, the right wife, you know. And he can't find the red string anywhere. And he's actually now um, really, really uh, upset and uh, 
full of uh, anxiety, and all of a sudden, he sees across the bathhouse this other guy doesn't even realize that he's got a red string stuck to his toe. So he runs over to him. He says, sir, please, please, you've got to help me. I'm absolutely certain I know who you are, but do you have any idea who I am? What's the point of law? I mean, I could tell stories all night. Maybe I should, but what's, what's the point here? The point is like this. There's an old Hasidic saying. It says, if I am I, because you are you. And you are you because I am I. Then I am not I and you are not you. But if I am I because I am I, and you are you because you are you, then I am I, you are you, and we can talk. Point is like this. Autonomous sense of self. Identity. If I know who I am, then I am who I am. But if I need to define myself by other people, by relationships that I'm in, by how people treat me or what they think of me, then, I, then I'm not I. I'm not the real me. And what ends up happening is you're not the real you either. I can have a whole elaborate relationship with you and it's not even you. It's the guy in the aisle seat who ruined my day, right? Somebody once told me some really insulting, really offensive uh, insight. He told me if you look back over your entire life and you, and you recall every dysfunctional relationship that you've been in that ended in chaos, hard feelings, hurt, and you examine them and you try to determine if there was a common denominator in all those relationships, you will find that there was one thing, one constant that was the same in every single one of them. You. <laughs> I didn't like that. So, the point is like this. I've got to be me. I've got to be the real me. Okay? And that's first and foremost. And after I'm the real me, I can start to have meaningful relationships with you. Same thing is, I got to let you be you, whoever that is, and then I can be I. And lest you think this is semantics, I mean, this is not just a, this is not a game. This is really a, the meaning of life. Like Shakespeare said, to thine own self be true. I mean, that's what it's really all about. You know, you can live a whole life and wonder, did you live it wrong? There was a great Hasidic master, his name was Abzusha. Zusha was a saint, he was a perfectly pious and holy man. He was on his deathbed, he was passing away, he was surrounded by all of his students who loved him. And uh, he was crying, so they said, Rebbe, why are you crying? He says, I'm afraid of judgment. They said, you, Rebbe, you lived a perfect life, how can you be afraid of judgment? He says, you don't get it. You think I'm afraid I'm going to come up to heaven and they're going to say to me, Zusha, why weren't you like Abraham, our patriarch? Zusha, why weren't you like Moses? He says, no. I'm afraid they're going to look at me and they're going to say, Zushya, why weren't you like Zushya? You can live a life, you can have accomplishments, you can have what to show for it, but if it wasn't your life, if it wasn't the unique mission that your soul came down to this world for, you know, what's it all about? So we can live a, we can live a script, we can live a, a role, play a game, but if that's not the real me, what's it all for? A guy walks into a doctor's office, he says, Doctor, help me, I'm a moth. Doctor says, you realize I'm a dentist, right? Guy says, yeah. Dentist says, so why'd you come in here? He says, the light was on. <laughs> that was your best job. You got it, right? <laughs> well, you can play a role and get everyone around you to play a role. You know, and actually it's kind of exciting because sometimes some of these roles can have a lot of drama in them, right? Uh, but it's not true intimacy, it's not genuine. It's not genuine, it's not me being me and you being you and those two things coming together. Sometimes we get a lot of excitement from the drama of a pretend 
relationship, it distracts us from the really scary thing of, you know, having a real relationship. So what I want to talk about is how to stop playing a game, how to stop being a fake self, how to find my true identity, and also how to let you be yourself. My father is a psychologist. My form of rebellion was to become a rabbi. You can psychoanalyze that if you wish. But at any rate, I remember one time I was about 14 years old. My father sat me down. He said, son, I want to tell you a joke. I said, okay. He said, what is the difference between neurosis and psychosis? I said, I don't know. What is the difference between neurosis and psychosis? He said, it's very simple. Psychosis is when you think 2 plus 2 equals 5. Neurosis is when you know that 2 plus 2 equals 4 and you can't stand it. <laughs> so I, I didn't realize at the time that there's a lot of wisdom in that statement. Um, what's neurosis? You know, trying to change what can't be changed. It's fighting with the facts of reality. Wasting my energy on stuff that's always going to be the way it is and then not using my energy on all the types of stuff that uh, I really do have an influence on. So as I got older, I started thinking, you know, I started looking for, for guidance. How do I know when I'm being neurotic? You know, what are the things that I'm wasting my energy on, and what are the things that I, I should be using my energy on? And I, I found a passage in the Talmud. I'll tell it to you in Hebrew, because it's very succinct, and then I'll translate it for you. But the Talmud says, Hakol bide shamayim, chutz yirat shamayim. Everything is in the hands of heaven, except for one's awe of heaven. So what does that mean? Everything is in the hands of heaven, except for one's awe of heaven. Essentially what it means is like this. Everything is in the hands of heaven. If there's a hurricane that cancels your flight, and you're in Vancouver on Thursday night instead of Tuesday night, that's in the hands of heaven. Okay? Okay. Whether your alarm clock goes off, or whether you hit a red light on the way to work, whether you catch a flat, whether uh, somebody drank all the orange juice and put it back in the refrigerator with one drop left. And these things are all in the hands of heaven. I don't control this stuff. Except for one's awe of heaven. So what is in my control? My reaction, right? How I feel about reality. So in other words, God is in control of orchestrating all the details of my life. I'm, I'm in control about how I feel about my life. Now, I don't know about you, but I, 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 just using myself as an example of human nature, it seems like human beings exert a whole lot more energy trying to change the conditions of their life than trying to change how they feel about their life. Trying to adopt a new perspective. Trying to develop their mindset. It's a shame, too. I, I, I once heard a guy tell me some real, real words of wisdom. He says, you know, there's three things I cannot change. The past the truth, and you. Mm -hmm. And then he added, this was the real punchline, he said, anytime I'm experiencing emotional pain, if I will be honest with myself and evaluate, I will be able to find that the emotional pain I'm experiencing is because I'm in the midst of trying to change one of those three, the three things. Either I'm trying to change the past, I'm trying to change the truth, or I'm trying to change you, somebody else. So that's what I call 2 plus 2 equals 4 and I can't stand it. In other words, we're having a fight with the facts of life. It's not a healthy way to be. And that's where all the suffering in the world comes from. Fighting with reality. Now there's a difference between pain and suffering, you know that? Pain is unavoidable, suffering is optional. What's the difference between pain and suffering? Pain is a response to stimulus. Okay, it's actually a survival mechanism. God gave it to us so that uh, when our hand starts to burn, when we put it on the stove, we pull it off, we don't leave it there. Pain is healthy, pain is normal, pain is unavoidable, and it's helpful. 
What's suffering? Suffering is the way I interpret my pain and assign to myself a script. I think I'm being too uh, abstract here. Let me illustrate it for you. I get up at 2 in the morning to go get a glass of water. I walk across the living room in the dark. I stub my toe on the ottoman and I say, Ow! That's pain. I then sit down on the ottoman, put my hands on my face, and say, Oh my God, why does stuff like this always happen to me? That suffer. <laughs> pain is the response to stimulus. Suffering is the interpretation that I make in my brain and then assign to myself a role, a script to live up to. It's not reality. So, the goal is to get out of that, to stop being reactive. To stop letting, to stop assigning the, these, uh, this power to circumstances, to people, places, and things. A better way to put it maybe is to become a thermometer, or to, become a, to, to stop being a thermometer, to become a thermostat. You know, a thermometer tells you what the temperature is in the room. The thermostat establishes the temperature in the room. Okay, so what's a healthy person? A healthy person gets up in the morning... And they, they thank God for existing, for having a life. And uh, in that mood, they go about life. What's an unhealthy person? An unhealthy person wakes up without an identity, without a sense of purpose or of value, and says, world, come validate me, let me know if I count. And what happens? The first person who looks at me doesn't smile at me the way I want to be smiled at. And boom, right there already, that takes a chunk out of my ego, and I'm hurt already, <laughs> right out of the gate. And then what happens is, I'm going about life trying to get an identity. It's not very pleasant to be around me when I'm in that mode, right? Because you see me coming, you feel it, you sense it in your gut. I'm coming to take from you an identity. I want you to let me know I'm okay. That's exhausting. You ever had somebody bestow upon you an act of love, and then not realize that you received an invisible invoice in the mail? And then they're mad at you because you didn't pay it. <laughs> like, you didn't know that if I take out the garbage without being asked, you're supposed to then come validate me and tell me how wonderful I am. You didn't know I was seeking an identity when I did that. So the only way to get out of this dysfunction is to have an identity that's independent of what people think about me. How do I have an identity that's independent of what people think about me? How do I have an identity that's independent of how my life goes? There's a, so I'm going to answer you. There's a verse in Psalms. Shviti Hashem l'nagdi tamid. I have placed the Lord before me at all times. In other words, God consciousness. I'm always aware of God. As opposed to what? God conscious as opposed to what? The opposite of? Self-conscious. Yeah. Okay. So how do I know that I'm God conscious and not self-conscious? The Baal Shem Tov said, Shiviti, I have placed, comes from the word Shaveh. Shaveh, if anyone speaks a little Hebrew, means equal. Equal. Even. Even Stephen. How do I know I am God conscious? Or conversely, self absorbed? By the degree to which I am rattled by life. When people don't behave the way I know they ought to behave, how deeply does that put me off my game? The God-conscious or spiritually healthy person is even, even keel. No emotional roller coaster, no ups and downs. Even, steady level of serenity, joy, purpose, focus. The self-absorbed person, what are they? Oh, they smiled at me. Oh, they frowned at me. Oh. They like me. Oh, they hate me. Oh. It's an awful way to be. There's a clinical term for it. It's called a codependent. It's an old joke I heard. What's the last thing that a codependent sees before he dies? 
Somebody else's life flashes before his eyes. Right? So what, what is that? That's I am serving other people in order that they should like me so that I know I'm worthwhile. So I have a sense of value. They don't have my own sense of value, so i got to get it from you. The joke I heard, there was this island where they had uh, this weird public uh, execution ritual. And they uh, had arrested uh, three people, uh, an alcoholic, an addict, and a codependent. And they were supposed to be publicly executed in the center of the island on this uh, platform. So the first one up was the addict. They said, come on up here, put your head on the chopping block. And they had this crude sort of guillotine type device with this blade that went up 20 feet in the air. The executioner pulls the rope back and the blade goes up 20 feet in the air. The executioner lets go. And the blade starts whizzing down the track. And a millimeter above the addict's head, it jams in the track and it's just floating there. The addict realizes he's not going to die. The executioner looks at him and says, it's the law of our land. We consider this an act of God. You are free to go live and be well. Next. The alcoholic gets up, puts his head on the chopping block. The executioner pulls this big rope. Blade goes 20 feet in the air. The executioner lets go of the rope. Blade comes whizzing down the track a millimeter above the alcoholic's neck. The blade just jams in the track. It's just floating there. And the executioner says to the alcoholic, this is the law of our land. We consider this an act of God. You are free to go. Live and be well. Next. Codependent gets up on the platform. Takes a look at the chopping block, takes a look at the executioner, looks at him and says, you know, I think I know how to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> Famous last words, along with, we were only trying to help. <laughs> or, you know, we've been talking and we know what might be good for you. Let me get in there, let me fix it, let me show you how it's done. So that's what we do when we don't have our own sense of self, we go around trying to fix other people, trying to get them to give us a sense of self, to validate us, to make us important, to make us matter. And then we wonder why we get into drama with these people. Don't you know I'm trying to take care of you? Don't you know I care about you? If I didn't care about you, I wouldn't do this. I mean, I'm trying to help you. I think... Love has ruined us. Whatever, yeah, I said it, love, love ruined us. Whatever a person, see, because love, love is about doing for somebody else. And it can be a beautiful thing when you're doing it for fun and for free. Altruistically, with no needs, no strings attached. When somebody with a true autonomous sense of self gives to you, that's pleasurable, because they're not asking for you to give them strokes and turn for their display of love. But love can be a really invasive thing because since love is giving, love is a, a move toward the beloved, it can be invasive, it can be in your face. As opposed to the opposite emotion, which is respect. Respect is a back off, step back. Respect and fear are similar. Right? Not exactly the same, but they're both a back off. So you back away from a rabid dog, that's fear. But you back away also from someone you respect. It's not fear, it's respect, but it's also a back away. Love is a move toward. Now I'll tell you something. We hear about love, 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 love people, love yourself, you gotta love yourself, you can't love others till you love yourself. And we never talk about respect, and I don't want to talk about it too much. And then when somebody's in the drama of a dysfunctional relationship, and things start to go wrong, and it could be any relationship, really, that's starting to go wrong. What's the first gut reaction is, i got to do something. What do I have to give this person to restore order into this relationship? What do I have to do? And you know what? The best advice probably isn't to do anything. It's probably, don't just do something, sit there. It's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive. I want to do something. Besides, if I don't do something, you tell me to not do something, huh, I don't look cool when I'm not doing something. Look how cool I am when I do something. Look at me give. Nobody says, look at me not giving. It's harder to do. 
It's a lot more fun, it's a lot more flourish to be the giver than to be the one who backs off. Love is a lot more exciting than respect. I've got to tell you something. In any relationship, any relationship, if you got to have one first and then get the other, first you've got to have the respect, then you've got to have the love. And I'll tell you even more than that. Let's say you know that you're only going to ever have one and the other one's not going to happen. So have the respect, even if you'll never have the love. Because if you have love without respect, then it's not even love. It's not real giving. It's giving in order to get. Did I give good? How'd you like how I gave? What's my score? It's giving in order to get. I'll give you an example. A guy is driving home from work. He is tired. He wants to just go home. The freeway off-ramp is right in front of him. He gets a call. Cell phone rings. He answers. He says, yes. It's his wife. She says, honey, um, did you pass the off-ramp yet? He says, no, not yet. It's coming right up. She says, good. Can you get off and go to the store and pick me up some, uh, I don't know, what she want? Milk. Milk. And he says, yes, dear. That is love. That's love. You can tell me, oh, that's too trivial. That can't be love. Let me tell you something. You, you go try not doing it one time. <laughs> you report back to me. You let me know. Okay. That's love. Okay? He wanted to go home. She said, stop at the store. He stopped at the store. That's love. I'll give you another story, another scenario. Guy is driving home. And he is fantasizing. He's been fantasizing since 11 a.m. when his boss first started dumping on him that day. And he's been fantasizing about going to the store and picking up a pint of ice cream. This is his fantasy. He's going to pick up a pint of ice cream. He's going to come home. He's going to put it in the freezer. He's going to wait till all the kids are in bed. He's going to sit on his easy chair. He's going to eat from the carton of ice cream with a spill. That is his fantasy. And as he is driving home, he's about to get to the freeway off-ramp to go to the store, and the cell phone rings. He picks it up. It's his wife. She says, I need you to come home right away. He says, yes, dear. That's respect. See the difference? See the difference? The first scenario, he wanted to go straight home. She said, can you stop at the store? He goes out of his way. Second scenario is, he wants to go to the store. She says, can you come straight home? He withholds. He restrains himself. Goes home. Right? Because love is what I do for you. Respect is what I don't do because of you. If you want to ask yourself, which is a bigger intimacy breaker? If I fail to do the stuff that I do for you? Or if I go ahead and do anyway the stuff I'm not supposed to do because of you? You look at it also on our relationship with God. You know, there's 613 commandments. 248 are positive, but 365 are negatives. There's a lot more don'ts than there are do's. Relationships defined by what you don't do, much more than defined by what you do do. But it's a lot more glamorous, a lot more fun to do. It takes a lot more humility and maturity to not do. I was once talking about this, and this guy he says, Rabbi, I have to disagree with you. I always love those guys, by the way. You guys say, I have to disagree. Not, I want to disagree. No, I have to. I am morally compelled to disagree with you. So this guy says, Rabbi, I have to disagree with you. I said, why? Why do you disagree with me? He says, you said that you have to have respect in every single relationship. If you don't have respect, then the love isn't even love. I said, yeah, that's what I said. He says, not in every relationship. I said, what, in which relationship does it not have to be? He says, with your kids. I said, how old's your kid? He says, five. I said, oh, good. Let me ask you a question. You ever come home from work and your little five-year-old son 
is uh, sitting on the carpet. He's playing trucks or Lego or whatever it is, and he just looks adorable. He looks cute. And all you want to do is just pick him up and show him how much you love him. You just want to pick the kid up and cuddle him up. And you go to pick him up, and they cuddle him, and he starts to squirm. He doesn't want you to pick him up. He wants you to let him go. He wants to play. What do you do? He says, with a big smile, I'd pick him up anyway. <laughs> I said, that's great. So that's love without respect. The love isn't even, even real love. Because what's going on there, okay? You don't have respect for him, for his limits. What are his limits? The autonomy over his own body. Even a small child has the right to have autonomy over his own body. I know in our culture sometimes, it can be absurd with allowing children to set limits that are not appropriate, that they don't have a right to make. Like five-year-olds coming home and setting their own bedtimes. You know, in the United States, I know maybe Canada's a little bit more civilized. <laughs> you have a five-year-old come home from kindergarten, he's like, Brian, Stacy, I want to call a family meeting. That's his parents he's talking to. Uh, Timmy's got a 6 p.m. bedtime. I want to negotiate for 6.15. <laughs> That's nuts. A child does not have a right to, to set his own bedtime. That's not a boundary that he's allowed to have. It's not his boundary to set. But autonomy over his own body? Is a child allowed to say, I don't want my body touched? I, wanna, I don't want affection to be bestowed upon me right now? Yeah, that's his boundary to call. And you don't respect that boundary, so then the love you give him isn't love. You're not loving him. You're loving yourself. You're not giving, you're giving to get, you're taking. Looks like giving, but it's taking. It's very insidious. Daddy comes home, he's supposed to bring energy into the home. He's supposed to give the positive vibe, not come and take it. You know the story about the locks? Locks is a singular word in Jewish, by the way. It's not plural. I don't mean locks like keys and locks. I mean locks, like a locks, you know. Salmon, okay. <laughs> salmon, whatever. You can't tell the story and say salmon. It's lox. So one time there was this lox who was swimming in the stream. And uh, a fisherman caught him. He says, oh, wow, I caught a lox. This is great because the king loves lox. I'm going to bring him to the king. And the lox thinks to himself, get me to that king because this crazy fisherman obviously means me no Nothing good here. He took me out of my home. But the king loves locks. Maybe he's like a member of PETA or something. Get me to the king. The king is going to treat me properly. So the fisherman's got, he wants to keep it fresh. He keeps it in a bucket and he runs up to the guard of the palace. He says, guard, let me in. The guard says, who are you? You're a fisherman. He says, yeah, but I have a locks. The guard says, oh, come right in. The king loves locks. And the locks says, get me to this king, this locks loving king. And he runs in, and he uh, gets to the uh, royal chef. The royal chef says, what are you here for? He says, I got a lox. He says, oh, great, the king loves lox. And the lox is thinking, get me to this king. The king walks in, he says, oh, lox, that's great. Chef, how are you going to prepare him? And he says, I'm going to saute him up in butter. Here you go. He pulls him out of the bucket, and he takes the big cleaver, and pop, smashes his head off. And as the lox is dying, with his last moment of consciousness, thinks to himself, he says, oh my goodness, these people are all fools. King, they say that you love locks. The truth is, you only love yourself. And a lot of people say, oh, I love chocolate. Would you jump in a freezing lake to rescue a bar of chocolate? <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to treat the chocolate with love. You want it to give you love. You want it to give you a feeling. You want to take from it. You don't want to give to it. You want to take from it. By the way, that's, that's, that's a reversal in the order of nature. Human being is supposed to give to that which he eats. If you don't, you don't have a right to eat it. It's a responsibility to eat something. You're supposed to give to it. What are you supposed to give to it? You're supposed to give it purpose that it can't accomplish on its own. Right? So if you eat meat, that's a big responsibility, let's say, because you take that cow, you know, well, if you can use that cow to do a mitzvah, which the cow can't do, so you're doing it a favor. You're giving to it. But if you're taking pleasure from that cow, what right do you have to take from it? You're supposed to be the giver, not the taker. That's a reversal in the order of nature. 
Love is forgiving, not forgetting. But if we don't have respect, if we don't have the boundaries in place, so then love is all about self-love. We have to have boundaries. We have to have respect. When we have respect, then the love is love. A guy comes home six hours late for dinner without colic, but he's got a bouquet of roses. No respect, but a lot of love. How's it going to go down? The wife's going to feel loved. She's going to take those roses from him. I'm going to take those. She's going to tell him where to put those roses, not in the vase. <laughs> giving is encroachment. Giving is invasive. Every form of giving is ultimately racked with selfishness except for one form of giving. There's only one form of giving which is not inherently selfish or self-expansive. You know what form of giving that is? One time of giving that's actually respectful? Giving someone space. Give them space. Back off. Like I said, it's a lot harder to back off than it is to move, to move in. I'll tell you a story that uh, I, I tell this only because it's a public record by now. It's public record because the Lubavitcher Rebbe maintained correspondence with thousands of individuals and many of those letters were published. And so there's a letter of the Rebbe to a particular person that uh, reveals an amazing, an amazing formula for how to deal with another person. The story is like this. I found out the back story after I read the letter, did a little research. There was a rabbi an emissary of the Rebbe, who was sent out to a place called New Haven, Connecticut. The name of this particular rabbi, and I only mention it because, as you see, as you will see, it is um, it comes up in the story. His name was Moshe Yitzchak. Moshe Yitzchak Hacht. So he writes to the Rebbe. And he tells them, I cannot go on. I cannot maintain my rabbinical duties. And uh, this I found out from inside sources. He sent them the keys to the school. In other words, it's yours. I can't do it. So you don't see that. that, that that's not published anywhere. But the Rebbe's response is published. So the Rebbe writes him back like this, and I'm gonna, I'll try, I'll try to, to convey it for you verbatim. The Rebbe writes back and says, uh, you say that you cannot go on and that you need me to do it all for you. But before you have called out, I have already responded. The Rebbe quotes a, a verse, Beterim, Beterim before they call out, I've already responded. And I've already done as per his request. And Reb Meishe Yitzchok Hecht has been sent. Now who's writing the letter? Meishe Yitzchok Hecht is writing the letter. The Reb is saying, I've taken care of it already. I've done as per his request. Situation is under control. And Meishe Yitzchok Hecht has been sent. He says, however, it is apparent from your letter that you've never met him. Therefore, my only advice to you is to get to know my hecht, and from then on, all of your conflicts will be resolved. So what's the beauty of this, of this response? I think 
the Lubavitcher Rebbe's love for Jews is pretty well known. I think everybody has heard stories, they know about how much the Rebbe loved Jews and how much he taught us to love our fellow Jews. I think that's pretty well love. What I don't think we talk about often enough is the respect. The respect. The, you can do it. No, you don't need me. No, I'm not going to run in and save the day. No, no, no helicopter mom, neurotic, come rescue, come save you, come shield you from life. You can do it. You're all right. Like they say, God has no grandchildren. We're all children of God. There's something immensely respectful about telling a person in crisis, no, no. I don't need to add to the drama by jumping in and getting involved. As much as that would validate my ego and make me feel helpful, you know, my ego would love to come fix your problem. But I think the respectful thing to do is to let you have some space and between you and God, I think you're going to work it out. Men are the worst at this, much worse than women. When there's a couple that's in a fight, man, you know your wife is upset with you. And what do you do? What do you got to do? It's like a compulsion. It's like a, you can't leave it alone, can you? Come on, just tell me what's bothering you. Come on. And she, she tells you, I don't want to talk about it. Right? She'll tell you. And you won't let it go. You won't let her go. Tell me what's the problem. Why? Because in your inflated ego and your inflated image of yourself, which is really a very fragile, needy ego that needs validation, you're convinced that if you know what her problem is, you're going to do something and fix it. Guys, she doesn't need you to do anything. She needs you to not do something. She needs you to back off. But to be able to back off takes an immensely spiritually healthy person. Because to back off means I have to be secure in myself. I don't need to be your hero today. I don't need to get points from you today to know who I am. Because I know who I am coming into this. The biggest source, the only source of drama in all our relationships is we meet people not knowing who we are. I don't know who I am. I don't have a sense of value or purpose. I'm looking to you to get one. So then the more messed up you are, oh goody, the more opportunities I'm going to have to feel useful. You ever wonder about that? You ever thought about that? Why we gravitate towards interesting people <laughs> with weird problems? Right? Because that's a chance to feel useful. A chance to figure out if I'm valued. So you ask yourself, why does the drama keep coming up? The drama comes up only for one reason. A lack of identity. A lack of self-validation. So you look to the world for validation. And the only way to have self-validation is to be constantly God-conscious. There's a, there's a prayer. Some people know. You might know. It's not a Jewish prayer, but I like it because it gives a little clarity as far as, you know, how to... Somebody once told me, there, there's three categories for anything that ever happens in my life. If I need clarity, there's just three columns. One is uh, my business, God's business, none of my business. Okay, so how do I know when I'm encroaching, when I'm making a move where I don't belong? How do I know when I'm getting up in your business? How do I know when the graceful thing is to back off and to let God run the show? So there's a, there's a nice prayer. It's called, it's called the serenity prayer. But it's not just about serenity. That's the first thing you pray for. There's the serenity for the stuff that I got to mind my own business about, and then there's the courage to step up to the plate and deal with the stuff that I can't do something about. And the prayer goes like this, God, give me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. 
courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. What does that mean? We talked about it before. Hakol bidei shemaim, chutz miyirat shemaim. Everything is in the hands of heaven except for one's awe of heaven. The way God runs my life, I need serenity to, to accept that. That's my life. What goes on between my ears, in this battleground right here, where I decide how to interpret the information, where I decide to find meaning or to find despair, that's where I have power. That's where I need courage. Courage to change the things I can, to change my attitude. What's a 2 plus 2 equals 4? Something that I shouldn't waste time with? What's going on around me? What's something that would be a good place to spend my energy? The way I decide to feel about it. How many of us take time as a, as a, as a regimen of our day to meditate and to try to proactively change the way that we experience events in life? We spend a lot of time thinking and planning on how to change other people or how to get people to do what we think they ought to be doing. How much time do we spend a day changing the way our brains work, rewiring our thought patterns through meditation? It's actually the most productive way to spend our time. And yet, probably the, the area that we spend the least amount of energy on. So I need to always remember that clarity. People, places, and things are about beyond my control. The way I interpret events and decide to react, that's totally up to my control. And so what I did is, I try to be practical. I devised a shortened version of the serenity prayer. And this is for like those moments when I'm feeling really overwhelmed because people aren't doing what, I need, what they need to be doing. And, and, and life is not going the way that I want life to be going. And, and I want to react. And my reaction is to get in there, you know, to go do something, to change something, to fix something. And, 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 and I need to get back my center. So, and I came, and, this, and the serenity prayer is too long for me. I'm, I'm liable to cause some damage in the amount of time that it takes to recite it. So I came up with a shortened version, and you're, 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 you're free to, to use it. It's not patented, it's free. Uh, a shortened version of the serenity prayer. This is what I do when um, I'm trying to uh, exert control neurotically over uh, life around me and uh, not owning up to my own uh, inner perception of things. Okay. It goes like this. you got to imagine it, though. Life is chaotic, and people are going crazy, and this and that, and this distraction, and this, and, and, and I'm reacting, and I'm, and I'm starting to feel sensitive, and, I'm starting, and I'm, the gears are starting to turn, and it's, it's getting out of hand. And all of a sudden, here's the here's short version of Serenity Prayer. It goes like this. That's it. That's it. <laughs> it's called a Yiddish Krechts. It's called a sigh. It's called a sigh. I want to tell you something. There's nothing more healthy than a sigh. Now, a sigh is very, very different than a kvetch. <laughs> Krechts is good. Kvetch, not good. Right? You know what kvetch eh, eh. If you're parents, you know that sound, right? <laughs> you don't even hear what they're saying. You just hear that internet, eh, oh, he's kvetching about. What's he kvetching about? See, a krecht is very spiritually healthy. A is, this is out of my hands. I can't control it. My gut tells me to jump in there and to rearrange the universe in order to, you know what? I think I'm going to let God be God so I can be me. I'm just going to be me. Because if I'm not being me, who's going to be me? I'm just going to be me and live my life. Here I am, little old me, showing up, seeing what happens, looking for an opportunity to be useful if, if needed, not pushing any agenda. Simple. Ah. That's. 
Kvetch means you come in already needy. You come in with a game plan. You come in with expectations. You know what somebody told me? Expectations are premeditated resentments. <laughs> you know, and something occurred to me as well. That any time I ever come into a situation knowing what's supposed to happen, I always leave feeling hurt. There was a Jew, he went to his, his Rebbe back in Russia. It's this moment where he gets to bear his soul to his spiritual mentor. It's like this big moment, right? And what does he tell his Rebbe? He says, the guys in shul are being mean to me. Can you imagine that? He says, I go to shul and everyone steps all over me. So you know what his Rebbe told him? told them, if you spread yourself out over the whole shul, anywhere anyone steps is going to be on you. What does that mean? When I come into a situation with an expanded ego, looking to get my needs met, I always get hurt. When I enter a situation with a very small ego, not from a needy position, but from a position of giving, but not giving in order to get, mind you. Giving when it's needed, if it's needed. And if nobody needs anything, that's even better, because it means everyone's okay. That's how you know, by the way, if your giving is healthy. If you're happier, then nobody needs anything. Can I beat you up and make you cry so I can come for you? Right? That's not healthy giving. Show up to situation in a mode of giving, if it's needed. If I show up like that, i got to tell you something, I usually have a pretty darn good time. But in order to do that, I have to have clarity. i got to tell you something, to, to not be needy is really tough, because I'll tell you something, it is very difficult for me to get clarity between what I want and what I need. Because anything I want, I, will, I can convince myself that I need and I'm never happy when I'm trying to figure out, oh, what do I really need? You know what works, though? When I try to distinguish between what I need and what I'm needed for. When I enter a situation having in mind what I'm needed for, things pretty much go smoothly. Because then I'm in tune with my true self. I'm in, true, I'm, I'm in tune with my true mission. I'm there to be the person that God knows that I can be. And I'm there to give to my surroundings rather than to ask my surroundings to define me, to let me know if I'm okay. There was a great sage named Hillel, most of us have heard of him, and Hillel gave the formula 2,000 years ago. He must have known some psychology. 2,000 years ago, Hillel gave us the formula how to have an autonomous sense of self, have healthy relationships, and to get a life. You know what he taught us? Three famous questions. The first question is, if I am not for myself, who will be? The second question is, if I'm only for myself, what am I? The third question is, if not now, when? I want to go through those three questions and show you the formula, the procedure, that Hillel prescribes for getting healthy. First thing, if I'm not for myself, who will be? One of the most missing, wildly misinterpreted phrases in all Judaism. You know how I hear people talk about that most of the time? If I'm not for myself, who will be? I'll see somebody like push three guys out of the way at the Kiddush, grab the last brownie, and say, what are you doing? If I'm not for myself, who will be? You know? <laughs> If I'm not for myself, who will be is not about being assertive. You know what it means? If I'm not for myself, who will be means if I'm not accountable for my own spiritual growth, who will be? You see, in all the commentaries, that's what it means. It means nobody's going to turn me into the adult that I'm supposed to be. I've got to become an adult on my own. Or rather, I should state it, between me and God. If I'm not for myself, who will be? I can't expect you to give me an identity. 
I can't expect you to validate me so that I feel like I'm worthy. I gotta know, I have a purpose. I have a unique godly mission. God sent me to this world. And that's who I am. That's the real me. I don't need you. And by the way, I don't mean that in a spiteful, sour grape style. Well, I don't need you. You know, it's, I mean, I don't need you to feel okay. I feel okay on my own. Once I am that way, now I can give. Now I can really give because I'm not trying to get when I give. I can give altruistically, for fun and for free. That's when I can ask the second question, if I'm only for myself, what am I? If I'm only taking care of my spiritual growth, but I'm not giving to others, that's no good either. But you've got to answer question one before you ask question two. I'll say that again. You've got to answer question one before you even ask question two, and I'll tell you why. Because if you try to ask question two first, not going to work. If you try to be a giver before you have a sense of self, ooh, that's dangerous. If you don't know who you are, you can't give altruistically. So first, I've got to be accountable for myself. If I'm not for myself, who will be? Second, I've got to be a giver. If, not, uh, 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 if I'm only for myself, who am I? Uh, what am I? And then the third question could be finally asked, if not, now when? I'll tell you what that means. If you ever meet somebody who's involved in a dysfunctional relationship, to any degree of dysfunctionality, you know, on that spectrum. The, really the, really the over, the overarching attitude there is one of, my life is on hold, okay? Until this person is going to get normal, so this person is going to do what they need to be doing, my life's on hold. Classic codependent, right? I can't live. No, I don't have a right to be normal. I don't have a right to be happy. Because so-and-so is misbehaving. i got to change that. Until that's taken care of, I can't have a life. Classic codependent. There's another clinical term for that, too. It's called Jewish mother. <laughs> Do you know all the Jewish mother and codependent jokes you can tell interchangeably? You can. It's like, how many codependents it take to change a light bulb? Don't worry about me. I'll sit in the dark. <laughs> That's also a Jewish mother joke. You tell that. I one time was talking about this same type of theme after I finished talking. I remember it was in Plano, Texas. This, this lady comes over to me afterwards. She says, Rabbi, thank you very much. I'm 50 years old, but I finally realized I don't have to be an erotic Jewish mother. Get a life. Preferably your own. <laughs> Be you. Be you. <clears throat> to thine own self be true. Be yourself. Be yourself. So, first thing is, I got to own up. Take responsibility for my spiritual growth. That's if I am not for myself, who will be? Bam. Second is, now that I have an autonomous sense of self, I can be a giver. If I'm only for myself, what am I? And once I do that, then I can answer the question, if not now, when? When does life begin? Now. 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 You know about the theological debate between uh, the priest and the minister? They were arguing about when does life begin, so they asked the rabbi. He says, when the dog dies and the kids go off to college. <laughs> when does life begin begins now. My life is not on hold because of your chaos. I don't have to fix you. I don't have to wait for you to be better for me to live the unique mission that God gave me. So let me just want to tell you one more thing. About having healthy interactions with other people. A lot of people think that if, if you want to get desired behavior out of other people, then the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? That, that's an old adage. Right? So, like, if you go to a restaurant, it's almost like you have to send it back at least once to let them know who's in charge, right? Otherwise, you know, it might take advantage of you. You've got to let people know. I'm only trying to be helpful here. It's for your benefit. 
people think that the most uh, important, you know, they put a premium, they, 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 they'll hear this, they'll say, look, I'm trying to be honest, you know, what, 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 look, when he does something stupid and annoying, I have to be honest, I have to tell him, so he'll change. If I don't tell him, he won't change. What does that, what does that do? What does your honesty do? You being honest for the benefit of that person? Or out of selfishness. Kills relationships. Absolutely destroys people. You shut people down. There was once an educator worked in a yeshiva for young uh, boys in France. And it doesn't have to be France, but that's where he was from. And he was uh, known as being kind of tough, being kind of strict. And people told him, they said, you're just way too demanding on the boys. you got to let up. So being a good chassid, what did he do? He went to his rabbi. His rabbi was a Lubavitcher rabbi in, in Crown Heights in Brooklyn. So he had a yechidus, a personal audience, and he went in. And he asked the Rebbe about it. Am I too tough on the boys? So he comes out of the Rebbe's room, and this grown man is weeping. He's gasping with gut-wrenching sobs. And everyone else there is taken aback what happened. And they surround him. They try to get the story. He can't even talk. He can't talk. So they wait until he collects himself. And they say... What happened in there? So he says, I went into the Rebbe and I, and I asked him the question that everybody keeps asking me. Am I too tough on the boys? So the Rebbe says to me, I too am an educator. It's an interesting answer, you know. He gave the Rebbe the opportunity to, yeah, yeah, you are too tough on That's what everyone, you know, they tell me too about you. They're real, respectful, you know, I'm not even talking about you, I'm talking about myself here. Yeah, well, you know, he said, the Rebbe says, I too am an educator. Interesting way for the Rebbe to speak about himself, but yeah, I guess it's applicable. He says, and um, I too have concerns whether I'm too demanding on my pupils. Talking about his tens of thousands of <laughs> adherents all over the world. So he says, so I'll just tell you what I do. And that's, if I come up with an idea that I think is good, first I, I, I assess for myself, do I think even half of the people are going to listen? And if, and if I don't think they will, I keep it to myself. So this, this chassid who asked the question is weeping and he says to now to those standing around him, he says, don't you understand the Rebbe has more to give us and we won't take it. There's a saying in the Talmud that more than the calf wants to suck, the mother cow wants to nurse. If somebody gives you something, don't critique what they're giving you. If you want more out of them, you know the best thing to do with what they gave you? Take it. Take it. If you have a spouse who doesn't communicate well, don't critique them when they don't communicate well. When they do communicate, take it and say thank you. Say thank you. The same thing with life. You know, we shut each other down all the time by turning up our nose at what they give us. We do the same thing with life. Life gives us a little bit of something good, but it's not exactly the way we wanted it. And we say, ah... Uh, Can you change this a little bit? 
It wasn't exactly the way I want. It wasn't the right timing. It wasn't the right... We think the most powerful prayer is please. It's not. The most powerful prayer is thank you. Life-affirming, reality-affirming thank you. If it's real, it's good. God only does good. And I just want to say, for the sake of, I don't know, reclaiming our cultural pride and identity, that, I, that we have to speak up against the, the Hollywood stereotype of the fetching neurotic Jew. It's simply not true. Simply not what we are about. The Jewish people have survived the most horrendous circumstances because we've always known how to say thank you. We've always known how to be life-affirming, reality-affirming, to see the good in whatever it is that we've got. We affirm the blessings we have that opens up the channels, opens up the flow to receive even more. There's a, a name for the Jewish people, Yehudim. The word Yehudi, the question that Talmud asks, why are Jews called Yehudim? comes from the word Yehuda, Judah, which is a tribe, one of the 12 tribes. Not all Jews are from the tribe of Judah. There's 11 other tribes. So the Talmud says, no. Yehudi doesn't mean from the tribe of Yehuda. It doesn't mean a Judean. Yehudi is actually a common noun, not a proper noun. It comes from the root hoda'a. You know what hoda'a means in Hebrew? Like toda. Thank you. Or modani lefanecha, the first prayer in the morning. I, I give thanks to you, God. Who is a Jew? Who is a Yehudi? Someone who's full of hoda'a, full of gratitude. But that word hoda'a has an interesting meaning in Hebrew. It doesn't just mean gratitude. It also means affirmation or acceptance. So for instance, if somebody states a fact and they say, do you acknowledge that fact? And the person is moda, that means they acknowledge the fact. So acknowledgement and gratitude are sort of the same word in Hebrew. It's a funny thing because I think a lot of times we say, I will acknowledge something if I'm grateful for it. <laughs> if I don't like it, no, I don't, it's not true. I don't acknowledge it. Do not accept this reality. But a Jew is one who is grateful for something because he acknowledges it. This is real. Hence it comes from the author of reality. And I am grateful for it. It's corny as heck, but I don't care. I love to say it. Every moment's a gift. That's why they call it the present. Every moment God is giving us reality, that's his business. We have a choice how to react. That's our business. What you do, that's your business. If each one of us does our job, God, me, and you, we're all going to get along just fine. <laughs> so, how about this? Let's say the short version of the serenity prayer together. Imagine the stresses of your life. Imagine the people who are misbehaving, who are not doing what they ought to be doing. The people who are not living up to what you think they ought to be living up to. And, on the count of three, one, two, three. <sighs> that sounded good, but we could put a lot more into it. Let's try it again. One, two, three. <sighs> and let us say, Amen. Amen. Questions, please. Is for the benefit of the recipient. I'll give you an example. If you're out at a restaurant with your kids and they are misbehaving, and you say to them, That's it, stop it, stop it, stop misbehaving. And you start to lose your cool. And you stop. By the way, is a good tool for life. Anytime you start to lose your cool, stop. And ask yourself the following. Do I need my kids to behave themselves because I, as a parent, have a mitzvah to educate them? And therefore, it is my obligation to train my children in proper social conduct. Or am I desperate for them to behave because it's embarrassing me? Huh, that's a good question. I'd like to know. Well, how can I figure out the difference? How about this? 
when they were misbehaving at the dinner table at home, did you get mortified or did you just ignore it? So all of a sudden it becomes clear to me that I'm not trying to inform their behavior for their benefit. I'm trying to do it for my benefit because it's bugging me. It's bugging me. If your behavior is bugging me, then I don't have any business trying to critique you. The same thing is with giving. If, I, if I'm trying to get you to do something by me giving to you, I shouldn't be giving. But if I'm willing to give to you, and I have absolutely no expectations that that giving is going to elicit any particular response, that's a healthy form of giving. See, giving should be a gift. The definition of a gift is it's no strings attached as opposed to being manipulative, as opposed to being a chess move. So a spiritually healthy person is always asking themselves that question. Is this a chess move, or am I in the moment right now? See, being in the moment means no expectations. In a Hasidic lexicon, we call it being a panimi. Panimi means an internal person. But what it really means is integrated, that my outsides are aligned with, aligned with my insides. What it means is what you see is what you get. All right? That what I'm doing is appropriate to the moment and appropriate to the relationship. Not me thinking three steps in the future, trying to plan out what's the perfect way to set you up to do the thing that I want to get out of you. If you're in the moment, then the giving is usually healthy. If you're premeditating, planning, plotting, the giving is usually a manipulative move. So the self-awareness is how you... In the moment, the self-awareness, how to check yourself, that's how you know the difference. Yeah? So, I think there's a balance between being grateful for what we get and, and being proactive for things like health or relationship. Can you talk a little bit about that? About being proactive? Yeah, because otherwise, it, you, you, don't we have to take some responsibility for if we want things in life? You know, you, do, we have, do we have to take responsibility for if we want things in life? It's interesting. There are plenty of people who do everything that you're supposed to do to succeed, and it never works out. So something tells me that there's no guarantee that doing the right thing will produce the right outcome. In fact, I'm pretty sure that no outcome is guaranteed. So the neurosis kicks in, the 2 plus 2 equals 4, and I can't stand it, when I start trying to produce an outcome. You know, somebody could jog every day and die of a heart attack, God forbid. Producing outcomes is neurotic. Somebody could work really hard and not have very much money. The neurosis kicks in where you think you're making a living. We don't make a living. God makes the living. We receive a living. The lexicon's messed up. When you say you make a, you don't produce a livelihood, you receive a livelihood. Okay, so when we think that we produce outcomes, that's when we get messed up. What we should know is that we're accountable for behaviors. So you talk about your health, you, you are responsible to behave in a way that's healthy. You're not responsible for the result. Okay, I'm responsible to treat people in a civil way. I'm not responsible for how you react to that. I, and so on and so forth, there, 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 there's a saying, let go and let God. But maybe even better is let go or get dragged. <laughs> Where do we get dragged when we become attached to outcomes? Focusing on outcomes takes the power away from where I actually have any influence. Focusing on behaviors mindset and behaviors, puts the focus where I actually have influence. You have to separate the two things. Do not use behavior and outcome interchangeably. Two different worlds. Yeah? So how do you know you are on the right path? Torah. You have to have a divine guidebook. That's why we study. That's where the Jewish Academy, that's where we're learning. That's where... You're right, how do you know? Some, some feedbacks on the way. Hmm? Some feedbacks on the way. Like an outcome can be a feedback at the same time and it gives you like, whether you do things right or... Yeah, but the thing about having 
a, uh, a higher authority to answer to is it keeps you away from people pleasing. So you don't adjust your behavior based on how people react. You have to be a panini, like I said before. That means completely integrated. It means I do something because it's the right thing to do, not because the way it's going to be perceived. If something is right, then I'm committed to it. It's not about what I'm going to get out of it. It's not about what the reaction is going to be. i got to tell you something. Sometimes we do all the right things. We do all the right things and God says, Hey, let me put you through a test. Let me see how tough you really are. You say, God, I was doing all the right things. That means you're supposed to be nice to me. God says, I, I know of no such agreement. A relationship with God, just like a relationship with anyone else, is not manipulative. It's not about getting a certain reaction. Don't. God is not the ATM in the sky. But I put in the right pin. Where's my money? It's a relationship. It's a relationship. Imagine a man tells his wife, Honey, let's go on a trip. She says, Where? He says, Why? She says, I want to figure out if I want to go. Doesn't sound very romantic, does it? So imagine God says to you, Let me take you on a journey called your life. You say, Where are we going to go? He says, Why? You say, I want to figure out if I want to go. I want to figure out what the outcomes are going to be. Life is supposed to be a romance. It's supposed to be a passionate relationship with God, with the author of reality. Don't ask him where he's going to take you. Don't ask him for a guarantee. If I do all the right things, I'm going to get all the results that I expected. The attitude has to be, if I show up, God, for this relationship, then you're going to show up. You ever seen people who are in love such annoying people. They'll say things like, hey, we just spent two hours grocery shopping together and it was so much fun because we did it together. Right? <laughs> or they'll be like, we went to, went to go uh, make a picnic in the park and it rained. We went to the show and the tickets were sold out. Went for a drive in the country and the car broke down. <laughs> it didn't matter because we were together. They're in love. Spiritually fit person is in love with his maker. He doesn't judge whether a day was a good day or a bad day based on whether it was to his liking. He judges was a good day a good day? Well, it depends. Was I with my beloved? A day that I'm God conscious is a great day. Irregardless of what happens. It doesn't matter what happens. We were together. Don't look at outcomes. Don't look at results. Look at the moment. Is the moment the moment of bonding of intimacy with your maker? We're way too attached to results. Got to get... Uh, Got to become real. Got to get real. Yeah? Yes, sir. Rabbi. You spoke before about the difference between pain and suffering. Yeah. So... How does a person end suffering from a personal tragedy that goes back a while? I'm, I'm going to be speaking about that Saturday night. <laughs> how to get over. No, but seriously, Saturday night, that's there's a, a, there's a talk called How to Get Over the You Ruin My Life Syndrome, and that's how to get over past pain and hurt. Get over it. By the way, I'm surprised that nobody asked me, doesn't this make you apathetic to other people's pain? Because I always get asked that question. Nobody okay. asked me? Somebody thinking? Apathetic. If you want huh? that, we ask it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll answer real quickly. Yes, we do question. How do you become somebody who is living in the moment and uh, accepting the gift called the present and then reconcile that with uh, not becoming apathetic to other people's pain? So a very simple thing. Again, you need Torah. Torah is clarity. Because what Torah does, it lifts you up, gives you a bird's eye view. You look... You look at life from the creator's perspective, which is an enlightened or elevated perspective, instead of being trapped down in our little 
limited perspective. Torah gives us clarity. I'm going to explain to you very simply. Once, once you have Torah clarity, you understand it's not even a question. It's so obviously two different things. It's two different things. Explain to you. UPS rings my doorbell. And they say, is this uh, 6537 Darlington Road? And I say, yes, it is. It's okay, I have an order for you from, uh, from Best Buy. Oh, great. I signed for it. I open it up, and it's a 40-inch TV. I didn't order a 40-inch TV. What, a 51? <laughs> <laughs> it was 50, no. And then I see my neighbor come out and say, hey, was UPS here? I ordered something from Best Buy. I wonder where it is. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. My neighbor ordered the TV. But they delivered it to me. I guess finders, keepers, losers, weepers. I'm going why is that wrong? I'll tell you why it's wrong. It's very simply wrong. It's not your TV. It wasn't delivered to you. You can't take it because it wasn't delivered to you. Same thing is like this. The expression that we have for dealing with pain, the expression the sages use is to be mekabal yisurim ba'ava, to accept pain with love. It's very important to accept pain with love. Accepting only applies to that which was sent to me. I can't accept a delivery on your behalf. I can only accept a delivery that's sent to me. In other words, if God says I need to go through some really rough challenges for whatever reason he sees fit, theoretically at least, I have it within me to accept that. I can because that delivery was sent to me. If God brings you to it, He can bring you through it. Or if, like Winston Churchill said, when you're going through hell, keep going. Okay, if it's my hell, I can get through it. I will get through it. But if it's your hell, I cannot accept your pain for you on your behalf. So you have to have that clarity that Torah gives. The Torah attitude towards my hardships, I'm going to get through it. I'm not going to close my eyes. I'm not going to turn my back on it. I'm not going to, I'm going to live through it. Torah attitude towards my neighbor's hardships is this is not right. This is not just. Stand up like Abraham and say, how can you do this to these people? Yeah, we, we can argue with God to ask him to be nice to our neighbor. But not to argue with him how he's treating us. It's a lot different relationship. It has to do with um, there's a there's a verse in the Torah that says Tamim Tia Im Hashem Alokecha. You should be Tamim. Tamim is a hard word to, to translate, but it means something like uh, pure, complete. What does it mean? The context where, where the Torah says this verse is it lists a whole bunch of different ways of uh, fortune telling, of trying to figure out the future. And then it says, Tamim tiyeh, Be pure, be complete with God. So the commentaries explain there, what does that mean? It means, as opposed to the nations of the world who seek out ways of reading the future, of knowing what's to come. God tells the Jewish people, Tamim, be pure. Be completely committed to this relationship. Don't be conditional. Don't want to know the future so you can figure out how dedicated you're going to be to me. If, if you're going to find out that I'm not going to take you exactly where you want to take, where you want to be taken, and that's going to diminish your commitment to this relationship, then you're not committed at all. You don't love me. You love yourself. You don't want to explore life with me. You want to be treated a certain way. So I can stand up and be righteously indignant about my friend's suffering because that doesn't compromise my commitment with God. But if I stand up and I tell God, you know what? I don't like the way you're running my life. 
that compromises the intimacy of the experience. You can make that choice. That's your choice to make. Do you want to live life in order to be treated the way you want to be treated? Or do you want to live life as an ongoing intimate relationship, every single moment, reality being a love, a bond between you and its maker? It's your choice to make. You can have a mind-blowing experience any moment you so choose. Right now. If you choose to have this moment be an intimate experience between you and your maker. Recovery.org, a site on addiction recovery powered by Chabad.org, a Jewish Judaism online mega site. Rabbi Taub's schedule today in Vancouver also included earlier this afternoon a uh, two hours workshop for professionals and community leaders in the field of mental health. I have to say I was at the workshop moved and inspired um, for the second time by Rabbi Taub and by the presence of um, so many dedicated people who truly care. Dozens of audiences on three continents have made Rabbi Tal one of the most in-demand speaker on human spirituality today. Topic for tonight is emotional sobriety. Can you become addicted to bad feelings and toxic relationships? using spiritual tools of recovery to improve our lives. On a personal note, I first want to say thank you to Rabbi Taub for being so accommodating um, in flexible in, in allowing um, his schedule to work around the hurricane and to make sure that uh, he will be here for the Vancouver community this week. Turns out, we have the privilege to also offer uh, and invite you for two more programs, actually three more programs with Rabbi Taub to take place in Vancouver. Without further ado, call Rabbi Taub uh, to please uh, share with us emotional sobriety. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you, Rabbi Bouton, for such a... Um, warm introduction. Um, let me reciprocate by saying... Health or power or privilege. Put simply, those who know grow. We are proud to uh, offer for the Vancouver community ongoing courses and lectures that have attracted on a, monthly, on a monthly basis, um, just over 180 people with all the programs combined. And tonight, we're happy to invite and we have the privilege to host um, a speaker as Rabbi Shea Stout. Rabbi Tao, a scholar of historic and mystical text, is renowned in the world at large as a man whose message of spiritual healing has brought hope to tens of thousands of people all over the globe. In 2010, Rabbi Tao's groundbreaking book on addiction recovery entitled God of Our Understanding rocketed to number one Jewish bestseller on Amazon. His message also became a sudden favorite, favorite among non-Jews in recovery. The New York Times reported on a tab's reputation outside of the Jewish world. They followed him to a professional training seminar that he led at the Boys Town Orphanage in Omaha, Nebraska. The New York Times declared Rabbi Tab has become a phenomenon. 
He has been interviewed as an addiction expert by NPR as well as, as, well as CBC Radio. His work was praised as a singular resource for those in need by Publishers Weekly. A regular Huffington Post contributor, Rabbi Tab also edits Jewish Weekly. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome. I first like to begin to uh, thank you all for being here tonight. I'd like to uh, thank our uh, co-presenter for uh, this evening tonight. As you know, this uh, evening is presented by several local Jewish organizations. First, I'd like to uh, thank the Jewish Federation of Greater Vancouver and acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, Shelley Rifkin, Executive Director. I thank her personally for her uh, friendship and uh, for her partnership in uh, uh, making this possible, as well as the Jewish Family Services Agency, which I see uh, uh, some uh, staff uh, here in the room. I also want to thank uh, Congregation Charit Sedek and uh, program coordinator Shelley Carroll uh, as well for her uh, partnership and uh, for her friendship uh, in making this evening possible for the Vancouver community as well as uh, the JCC, the Jewish Community Center of Vancouver. I think that um, this says something about this program and hopefully many more, uh, this community partnership coming together uh, with the Jewish Academy to uh, provide uh, for you top quality uh, adult education. The Jewish Academy is the newly launched and recent initiative of Chabad of Downtown. In the words of our Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, uh, sent greetings to the opening of the Academy. This new institution will offer your membership strong educational programs and enrich enriching opportunities that will inspire lifelong learning and an enduring appreciation for Jewish values. I think that if I was to sum up the, um, the academy and the reasons, the goal, the purpose. I think the best way would be to read you a, a portion of a letter we received from Chief Rabbi Lord Sachs in honor of the opening of the academy. There is no more important task than that of Jewish education. That is why the opening and official launch of the Jewish Academy is such a vital initiative. For Jews, education is not just what we know, it's who we are. No people ever cared for education more. Our ancestors were the first to make education a religious command and the first to create a compulsory universal system of schooling. The Egyptians built pyramids, the Greeks built temples, the Romans built theaters, Jews built schools. They knew that to defend, to defend a country you need an army, but to defend a civilization you need education. So Jews became the people whose heroes were teachers, whose citadels were schools, and whose passion was study and the life of the mind. Jewish education and Jewish learning is not only our heritage and history, it is also the single most important factor that will determine and define the Jewish future. Education counts for more in the long run than what 
an immense honor to be here at the launch of the Jewish Academy, and I want to join with everyone here in wishing you absolute success beyond whatever you even dream, and I know that you dream big, but it should be even more than what you're imagining, and the influence of the Jewish Academy on Jewish education and Jewish life here in this city should uh, flourish and should reach many, many people, many families for generations to come. Uh, it's true that we were originally scheduled for Tuesday night, and then God had other plans in the form of Hurricane Sandy. So, um, yeah, I've been traveling since 4.30 in the morning Eastern time. It was like 1.30 a.m. Vancouver time. And I was, um, I was uh, thinking of a, a story having to do with travel. That there was once a guy, he had this thing. Whenever he flew, he had to have the aisle seat. That was his thing. And he was so into it, he would call like three months before, and he would book the ticket, and he, would, he wouldn't do it online, because he has, he has to speak to a person. And he would confirm with the person, is this, you know, 32F, is that the aisle seat? Yeah, it is the aisle seat. Okay. Then a month before, he would call again, he would confirm it again. Two weeks before, he would call again. The week of, he'd call every day. The day before, he'd drive down to the airport. He'd speak to the ticketing agent. And then the day of, obviously, he'd get there a few hours early, and he would not let them print his boarding pass till they would look him in the eye and tell him, yes, 32F is an ILC. That was his thing. So he flew to his uh, point of destination, and he gets there, and his friend comes to pick him up. And he looks agitated. His friend says, what's wrong? You look upset. Is anything... Uh